Uh, hey, my name is Brett Slack, and I'm a software engineer here at Google. Uh, we're here today to talk about uh, Indie Web Camp uh, and the independent web with Tantek Chelik, uh, who's a technologist, writer, and teacher. Uh, he currently uh, is at Mozilla, uh, focusing on open web standards. And you may also know him as a creator of many communities uh, like Barcamp and Microformats. Uh, you can find Tantek at tantek.com. Uh, so yeah, let's get into it. So Tantek, you recently won an election. Uh, what was that election about? So I recently ran for the W3C's advisory board. And that's a board of about like nine people that advise the W3C on, on all matters like process, running the W3C, all that kind of thing. And it's elected by all the member companies of the W3C. And this is for web standards like HTML and CSS and basically everything that makes up the internet, the web as we know it. Yeah. So the advisory board doesn't work on those standards, but sort of works on the pro like how does the W3C work at all right. to create the groups that then work on the governance standards. and things governance like that. Governance and things like that. So that was um, a bunch of us have been pursuing making standards more open, how they're developed more open, and, and ran for the W3C advisory board on this sort of platform of openness. And, and some of us got elected, and so now we're, we're going to be pushing to, to make the W3C even more open. That's in, great. And how it works. So open is very important to you. Um, we're talking about the IndieWeb today, and you know, maybe some people don't know, what is the IndieWeb? What, is, what does the IndieWeb mean? So the, the indie web is really about uh, people uh, owning their own content, owning their identity, owning their own you know, domain on the web mm -hmm. and controlling it, doing with it as they please, and, and using that as their primary identity on the web. And that's uh, sort of in contrast to creating an account on some system, on somebody else's system, and posting your content on someone else's site. Great. So there's also an event that you help organize called Indie Web Camp. Um, mm -hmm. It's been around for a few years now. It started in 2011. Um, and it's happening next week in Portland, uh, June 22nd and 23rd. Uh, so tell us about Indie Web Camp. What is Indie, Indie Web Camp all about? So the Indie Web is, uh, you know, it's, it's all fine and dandy to like create your own website. But we're, you know, as, as humans, we, we build communities around, around the things we have in common. And the Indie Web Camp really started as kind of a bar camp, dev camp, for those of us that are passionate about the indie web, creating our presence on the web, but we wanted to collaborate and, and share our ideas and share our code and share our designs uh, for doing so, and hopefully even get our sites to talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And that's we can we can get into a little bit of that later. So, what kind of people go to Indie Web Camp? Uh, the people that go to Indie Web Camp essentially you have to you have to be dedicated to owning your identity on the web. So you have to have your own domain and be like, this is me. This is who, this is who I am on the web, and I don't mind putting my stuff up there. Uh, and then you have to be a creator of some sort. So whether that's uh, a builder or developer, like you write code, or you do user interface design, or you do you know, graphic design, or, or, or you know, any kind of flow. Um, even if you're just like a, a, a content author, and like being an independent content author is like your thing. You have to be a creator of some sort. And then the third quality that we look for is people that are willing to freely share at least some of what they create so that we can build on each other's work. So those, that's really what it's about. You, know, you, you have your own identity on the web. You're a creator of some sort. Uh, and then you share some of what you create openly and freely. Great. So what inspired you to pursue the indie web and, and, and start Indie Web Camp? So I've had, I've had my own site for a while. And uh, it's, I, I've, been, I've been blogging since 2002. And a lot of that, I, I kind of slacked off on that myself um, with, uh, with sort of increased use of Twitter and, and Pounce and lots of other services, Flickr. Uh, but one of the things I, I, I finally realized there was, there was like the more I use these services, the more frustrated I got with different things, and uh, I just couldn't do things like I wanted to add navigation between my, my tweets, and, and you know I have to like wait for Twitter to do that, right? Um, or well, and there's also some bad examples too of you know so there's there's cases where you want it to be more custom or, or more flexible, but there's right. also cases uh, that I know of of you know data loss or even losing your content. Uh, yeah. Uh, could you talk about those a little bit? So the on the on the on the sort of like Saturday side, or like why a lot of a lot of folks come to the indie web is they they build up a whole site, a community, something on someone else's site, and then it gets shut down. Oftentimes, very little notice. Oftentimes, um, with no easy way to like download your content. You know, sometimes you can download the content. Sometimes, but uh, I think Postgres is sort of like the most recent example, and and this seems to be a cycle that repeats uh, like almost every year. Large company acquires smaller company all the content, and then like within a year or two, the content and the URLs are all lost. Right. So it's one of those uh, downsides of whenever you go and you put your content on someone else's site, we call that sharecropping. So it's the same practices of, of like, you know, trying to actually like grow your, uh, grow your crops on someone else's land. Right. right? You don't actually don't have control over it. Mm -hmm. um, 
And then how about identity? What's, what are some cases of uh, you know, identity, the problems that happen with identity uh, in the indie web? So one of, the, one of the things with like, buying a domain name is it's pretty much yours unless some company comes by and says, hey, we have a trademark on that name, we're going to take it. And then you're sort of like dealing with like, the broader legal system, right? But with, uh, with accounts on, on any random system, the, 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 uh, the site provider, uh, the social network, whatever, can decide to give away your account or to, to block it for any reason. They all have very different terms of services. They essentially amount to like you don't own anything. We control everything. We can do whatever we want. Right. Uh, so a lot of people have have either lost or had their identities even reassigned. Um, and there's really no recourse when that happens. There's there's basically no like is there's basically like no like legal recourse because you you agree to the terms of service which let them do whatever they want. Right. That's what all the terms of services essentially come down to. Mm -hmm. um, some of them are a little bit better about that. Like you know, Flickr's long time had had a really good like you own your content. You know we don't we don't we don't you know. It's, claim any rights to it or something like mm -hmm. that. And it would be better, it would be nice if there were more sites that did that. But in general, sites sort of err on the side of, no, we own everything, and, and you're just kind of like playing in our playground because right. we're letting you do it for free. So that's kind of more the worries about what the indie web solves. You know, yep. uh, what are some of the positive things that the indie web helps with? You know, and and wh you know, what are the good positive reasons that people would want to join the indie web? So like, like many things, like a lot of these frustrations turned into sort of like the mode of invention, right? Like you go, you're like, okay, I want to build my own thing because I'm frustrated with, with what the service is offering me or not offering me. And you start doing that and you realize, wow, I actually have so much more freedom here to do uh, amazing things. Like I'm not limited to 140 characters. I can start embedding uh, images in line, JPEGs and, and, and you know, movies or whatever, um, in a much better way than, than Twitter does it. Or whatever. I can provide a better user interface, a cleaner user interface than what Twitter does. And for user interface, you mean your readers, the people who consume That's right. what you create. Right. So on my site, like yeah. on contact.com, I can post a video and I can post an image and I can post a series of them and it'll show up like you know, interspersed in my content. And it, it's, uh, I think I can provide a much cleaner experience for people to come to read my content there than on Twitter uh, and all the other sites where you see lists of like suggested followers, or you know, here's some other ads you might check, or maybe there's a promoted account, or you know, all this noise, and that's that's kind of it. Seems like every content silo eventually deteriorates into something like that, where mm -hmm. you're just surrounded by all this distraction around, around right. the actual content. Yeah, so you have control over the way it looks and, the and feels. The experience. Yeah, then that's that's, a, that's a really big big thing for me. The personal expression is a big one. Mm -hmm. uh, I get to like alter the design however I feel like. Um, so there are any other examples of positive things that you know that come from that? I mean, so you get to customize, but what what are some other what are some other positives? So we talked about sites going away. In fact, we have a whole page on like site depths where we, chrono we have a chronology of like different sites have shut down, how many people's accounts have lost, links have been lost. If you own your own domain, right? You basically it's like it's like owning your own phone. As long as you're paying the bills, you've got that domain name. And you've got your content there. You mean like a phone number, like a portable phone number. Right. You could, you could go between providers and That's right. nobody can take it away from you. Right. So right. just like you can port your phone number between providers, you can port your domain between web hosting services. And you'll pay someone to host it there, some you know, trivial amount, mm -hmm. less than it costs to have a phone. Right. A lot less. Right. Right. Um, but we put so much energy into so, into so much of this content we create for the web, and yet you know, we, don't, we don't sort of back it up with as much even a fraction of what we do for, for just having a phone number. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Um, so I've been to Indie Web Camp. Uh, I'm going again this year. Uh, and I wanted to talk about some of the things that people hack on at Indie Web Camp. Um, so two of the examples that I know about uh, are kind of these kind of funny terms. Uh, yeah. the, the, this posse and pesos. Uh, so I thought I'd talk about that real quick. Um, so these are kind of, the, the thing is, in the Indie Web, you know, if, you, you know, if you make content on your own site and you, and you publish on your own site, uh, you still want to engage with your audience, and you want to you want to push your your what you've created to Twitter and to Facebook and Google Plus and on and on because you want as big of an audience as possible. You, you know, you're, you're writing content to be read in a lot of ways. Sure. Um, so, you know, but the question is, how do you engage with your audience without losing control? And so, posse and pesos are two of the ways I know of doing that. I was just going to say what they are. The first one, posse, is publish on your own site, syndicate elsewhere. Uh, so this is where you have your blog, you publish to it, and then you tweet out a link or share a link on Facebook that people can find. Uh, the second one is Pesos, where you actually publish somewhere else and then suck all the content back into your own site. Yep. Uh, and there's a bunch of tools that'll do this now. So you can just engage all, all over the place, but then they'll, almost like an, archi like an archive, personal archive, it'll bring everything back to your site so there's one place to find everything. Right. 
Uh, so then what are some other examples of things that people hack on at Indie Web Camp? Uh, what can we expect? So I think a lot of it really comes from the core value of, because it's your own site, because you're putting your own stuff out there, uh, and you're building on it, that's, uh, that's something we call self-dogfooding. There's this concept of dog fooding that we have like in the industry of like, yeah, like eating your own dog food, like whatever you create, like working on it. And it's oftentimes applied at companies where a company will like have an API. And so they'll build on top of their own API to make sure that the API actually works properly. But we're, we, we've introduced this notion of self dog fooding where it's like, it's not just you at your company, but you f with yourself. And I think once you start doing that, you realize, oh, well, my priorities for what I want to do are very different than if I was just building a product for some person because I want to own my own content, I want to control it, but yet I still want to stay in touch with my friends. And that's really where Posse came from, was this like diligent s desire to own your own content, but then like, hey, my friends are reading on Twitter, or my friends are reading on Facebook, or my friends are reading on Google Reader. Wherever they're reading, you're like, okay, I have to have a feed, right, if someone's using a feed reader. Or if someone's just using Twitter, I need to post copies of my content to Twitter or Facebook. Mm -hmm. But in all those cases, one thing we've, we've tried to do is like make sure that there's always links or, or some identifier pointing back to the original. And that's important because when you start um, kind of forking these conversations in these different you know, uh, forums, you may want to actually integrate them back right. in your own site. And somebody might want to see like, the whole story of what's going on. Yeah, that makes sense. So that's, uh, that's kind of what, what, drove, what drove Posse. And what's, what's kind of interesting is that the indie web efforts really have built on a lot of previous efforts like Federated Social Web, mm -hmm. things like that, that were like, looking to create a giant distributed social network of different sites and yep. things. But when, when we all took an independent, individual approach to it, so the word indie sort of has double meanings mm -hmm. here, it turns out that the priorities really changed from, oh, federation to like, no, we want to stay in touch with our friends. Like a lot of that comes down to that. We talk about like readers and audience, but a lot of the folks on the indie web are doing it purely you know, as, as hobbyists, as independents, mm -hmm. not, um, not necessarily as a business. Or well, sure, if you want to do it as a business, it makes sense too. You should own your own site. Right. Yeah. So then the range of projects that we're going to see, I mean, it's, it's a lot of hobbyists and amateurs uh, in some ways, uh, yep. non-professional reasons to do it. It's a lot of labors of love, that kind of thing. Um, I was thinking, you know, what are, what are a couple of examples of that? I know that uh, Realme Auth was a big thing last year. Uh, indie Comments are another thing kind of this year. Uh, maybe you could tell us a little bit about Realme Auth and, and Indie Comments. Uh, and sure. So Realme Auth arose out of a need to do independent identity with URLs. And so th there's, this, uh, there's a standard called OpenID that kind of solved this problem, did a great job. There's a lot of deployments out there. And you can set up your own site to be your identifier and log into all these different sites with OpenID. Now, the challenge is that on the indie web, everyone's sort of a small, scrappy developer because they're all developing it themselves. And so if you want to uh, consume an OpenID, it's actually a lot of work. It's very difficult. It's yeah. really difficult. A lot of us have tried and, and looked at the libraries and like, gave up. And we're like, this is just too much work. There's got to be an easier way. Um, since OpenID, things like Twitter, sign in came out, Facebook Connect, all these silo specific And services even came OpenID out. Connect, which is trying a simplification of OpenID, you yeah. know, because they realized that there were some issues. They tried to come out too, but yeah. that didn't really, didn't yeah. really take yeah, off. So Twitter and, and Facebook really raised the bar mm -hmm. in terms of like, it should be this easy to integrate uh, sign on. Right. You know, so sort of third party delegated sign on to your site. So we're like, okay, that's good. That's a good bar to set. So with Realme, we have a way of connecting your site to your Twitter account or your site to your uh, GitHub account. And from there, what we do is we say, hey, we'll use your site as your identity. But since you're delegating your authentication to GitHub, we'll use GitHub's OAuth support that they already have. And all their in, security that comes with that. And all their security that comes yeah. with that to authenticate you. Right. So you kind of get the best of both worlds. We're going to keep track of you as, uh, what's your domain again? Uh, big one fluke? Big Fluke. One yeah. Big Fluke, that's yeah. right, uh, .com. But whenever you log in, we're going to authenticate you using whatever providers you happen to provide right. at that point in time. Right. Yeah, so that's how Realme Auth started. It's sort of like a simpler version of OpenID-like work that people could consume. That was much easier to implement. That's great. And um, then what about, what about the new IndieWeb comments? So IndieWeb comments are, are kind of a fascinating uh, rebirth from an effort that was about, lower, about 10 years ago. So about 10 years ago, uh, Ian Hickson uh, developed and wrote this spec called Pingback. And it, it it's kind of was the evolution of a lot of other efforts like track back of like blogs talking to blogs and trying to include excerpts or be like, hey, I linked to you, here's the ping back. But it never really solved the comment problem. And by the comment problem, I mean if you want to comment on a blog, you have to go to that blog, you have to like sign into that blog, you have to like type a comment on that blog, and then it's kind of there. It's like a dead end. Mm -hmm. um, or there are services now that do this with JavaScript right. too. Right. You know, a bunch of them. But that just means they don't get indexed. 
Um, so, so we wanted to solve this like, well, no, if I write a blog post, if another person wants to comment on it, like on the indie web, they should write the comment on their own site and then send it to me. Right. And then I'll show it, syndicate it in, show it just as good as if someone had written a comment na natively. And that reminds me a lot of the Tumblr model where you kind of, you know, re you reblog something and then add your add, add your, your little bit, you, to, you it. bit to it. Yeah, it's very exactly. similar to that. It's very like similar to the Tumblr model. But it's distributed, uh, so anyone mm -hmm. can do it from any site. Yes, that's the that's the biggest difference there. And we were basically working through the pieces of how to make this work. There's a simplified version of Pingback called Web Mention uh, that uses like just pure HTTP, essentially. Mm -hmm. There's no XML RPC in there. Right. Um, that's great. And then the other big piece was really came down to presentation. So to make a comment look good, I'd say if like if there's one big distinguishing feature, like in addition to self dog fooding of the indie web versus sort of previous efforts, is that we're all focused on making our sites look good mm -hmm. and feel good because it's our own site. Right. Right. You, you tend to. Uh, and there's a lot of designers happen. in the community too, so it seems like it's, it's a much it's more designer friendly community, yeah, right? For sure. So with comments, it's the same problem. We're like, okay, you bring up someone's comment post, and we got to make those comments look just right. What does that mean? We need the content of the, of the comment. We need the permalink of the comment. We need an avatar for the person. We need a link to their site, right? We need a date and timestamp. We need all these things, which it turns out we actually have all that with microformats, right? So people publishing this on their on their web page in HTML. Just adding a few simple microformats, uh, hentry, hcard, saying, hey, this entry is here, and here's the hcard author of it. All we had to, had to do is actually add one rel value um, in reply to, mm -hmm. so that you could link to the thing you're commenting on and say, rel in reply to. This is a comment in reply to this post. And by doing that, it made it so it was discoverable. Right. right? Um, and then the person posting the comment just sends a web mention to the original post and says, hey, by the way, you know, just like Pingback, I, I, I mentioned you, but this is actually a reply, a comment. Gotcha. The guy's site goes back and says, okay, let me, let me read your permalink that you claim as a comment, see if you're linking to me. Yeah, you are, you are with rel equals reply, reply to, cool. Let me get to contents of your comment. Oh, let me get your avatar. Great, now I can display it as if it was a native comment on my own site. That's great. And that just happened, uh, like- yeah, this is very recent. Two, like uh, less than two months ago. Yeah, and how many sites are doing in a, kind of the indie web comment so I have to actually now. look at the site because yeah. when it started, um, I, I, I remember blogged. two. It was obviously two was the beginning, and then it was three very quickly after that. And yeah, what are we up to now? Right. Like so, within within minutes, the first comment showed up and it worked, yeah. and it was kind of like magic because the guy writing the comment didn't know it was going to work. Yeah. Uh, and then um, there's follow up commentary, and and within a few days, there was like four people. Yeah, four people from four different countries. Right. Belgium, the U.S., and totally France, separate and implementations as well. Totally separate implementations, yeah. different sites, um, uh, and, and the funny thing is, none of them from the Bay Area. Yeah, right. That was the other thing. Uh, that's cool. It's like IndieWeb is like such a distributed thing, but now if you look at it, there's like let's see. Uh, so since those a lot. four, yeah. um, we also. And got so you, do, you expect more this weekend? I mean, five, after this coming weekend at the IndieWeb camp. Seven. Yeah, seven. So we're up to seven different implementations. Right. And I think out of this weekend at IndieWeb Camp, you know, next weekend, uh, hopefully we'll get a lot more because that's kind of what, what happens is a lot of hacking and, and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, in fact, uh, Ben Wordmuller is the first one in the Bay Area to actually like, okay. uh, to actually like join in this thread and this this comment thread on uh, Eshnu's uh, blog, where he he literally just started with like saying testing IndieWeb Federation with and then he like and it worked. He, he at yeah. mentioned a few folks, which works over the IndieWeb, and then a bunch of people started commenting on it, and now it's become this kind of proving ground when you've got commenting working on your site. You kind of go leave a comment on his original post testing this. Yeah. So you can kind of see a chronology of who got what working when. It's very exciting. Yeah, it's exciting. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. So yeah, that's the other thing. So there are more spaces. Uh, before we go, we'll there's, a, there's a few more spaces in the web camp uh, next weekend, June 22nd to 23rd. Eight. So there's eight spaces, eight spots left. In, yeah. in Portland, Oregon. So if you are around and have the time, please come and sign up at indiewebcamp.com. Uh, you can find Tontech online at tontech.com. Uh, you can find me online at onebigfluke.com. And thanks very much uh, for watching.